Hello and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Steve Lee Andrews, bookseller, writer, collector, and today we're doing our first Skype interview on the channel. We've done the interview, of course, with Tom Toner. Tom's popped up a few times, as you know, but this is the first in a series of videos that I'm going to do talking to predominantly British SF writers over the next year, predominantly the literary end of things, but we'll see what happens. We'll see who else pops up. And I'll be doing another interview later this week. You'll probably see both of these over the Christmas period. And early in January, there's another one scheduled. So, and there'll be more to come, as I say. So today, our special guest is Nina Allen. And some of my favourite books by Nina include The Rift, which is her BSFA award-winning novel published by Titan. There we go. And another favourite of mine is her sort of fix-up collection, which forms a novel called The Silver Wind. This is the first edition. There's now an expanded edition out there as well. And forthcoming next year, next May, I think it's the day after my birthday, actually, um, is her next book, Conquest. This is an uncorrected proof. I showed you this already. And there will be a review of this and possibly another brief interview with Nina nearer that time. So that's what's to come. The idea is to give you an overview of her career. And uh, maybe if you enjoy this and read some of it, perhaps next time we talk to her, we can get some of your questions in and we'll see what we can do with that. So I'm just waiting now for you to give me a call and we'll go from there. So Nina, hi, good to see you. It's great to see you, Steve, after all this time. Oh, I know, when was it? It was for the tour for The Dollmaker and it was in Froome at Hunting Raven, lovely little bookshop. Now, when was that? Was that 2019? Or... That was, no, it was earlier than that. I think it, it was definitely, obviously, pre-COVID, but I yeah. think it was like 20, was it 2019 or 2018? Uh, somewhere. I, I, I do have some notes here, so I should I should really, I, looking, um, 2019 was the doll makers. It was spring. 29, I mean, it's amazing as time just seems to have gone very strange like anything that happened pre-covid is almost in a different planet very much so yeah so we're in a science yeah. fiction situation sort of yeah pandemic you know we, we are <laughs> living the apocalyptic fiction dream or nightmare um, and before that last time i showed before that because it's only every few years we get to see each other um was when i hosted you in bath for the bookshop event when um the race came out it was um, the race and it was Chris was also, I think, launching The Gradual, wasn't he? Yeah, that's right. It was yeah. it was um, November 2016. I've got the date for that in my head. Amazing. Uh, I started yeah. doing events then. So again, after a long hiatus. So that was good. So anyway, um, what I wanted to do today was sort of give a career overview to the audience. Some of them will have read you, some won't. And of course, you know, people should be reading because I think your work is excellent, as you know, um, as I've said in public many times before. And so I thought if we talked to, about about your career and sort of focused on the long books, but what have you. But talking about the race now, correct me if I'm wrong, because I don't have a hardcover of the race, but the race was new con in hardcover. It was originally. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, that was, I think, about 20 14 2015 when that was first published by newcom yeah and what i'm going to do we, we can't see them now obviously i'm going to stick some covers up on the screen so we see them and the cover of the race the original jacket design is absolutely beautiful you know i'll, I'll flash that up and i wish i'd That's managed ben to get baldwin. that ben baldwin's beautiful cover yeah it's fantastic isn't it so i i'm watching out for one because i was a bit slow on the uptake there and obviously, as I say, when we when we met in 2016 and did that event, um, it was the Titan paperback. And even though you'd had books published before that, novellas, um, link collections, the good old fix ups, as we say in SF, that was your sort of debut novel as such, wasn't it? And it's a really sort of kaleidoscopic narrative. There's a lot going on. It's got a complex structure. There's about four focused characters. Um, striking SF motifs from the small things like um, the genetically engineered greyhounds, which I loved, which was both a sort of prosaic thing and yet it's like a real world thing. It shows that in science, that's the way it really affects our lives a lot of time in small ways and, and gradually moves forward. And there was big stuff like environmental collapse and you know, there was that sort of wonderful British strangeness about it, the small and everyday. And yet there were things like the bizarre oceanic rituals with the, the cetaceans, the whales. And um, 
and again tense sibling relationships which is something you've done quite a lot which i always enjoy so did you sort of deliberately aim for a challenging work for your debut novel or did it just sort of arise organically out of, out of what you've been writing up to that point I would say very much the latter. I mean, it's right. interesting. I, it, it's interesting that you refer to the Silver Wind and what is now Ruby, what was then Stardust, as mm. fix-ups, because yeah. that's how they appear. And you know, the, the tradition of fix-ups in SF, as you say, is is like a that is novels that are assembled from a number of independently published short mm. fictions. That's been a long-established tradition in SF, and although. The Silver Wind and the and the, and Ruby appear to be fix-ups, and some of the stories were indeed published independently. They weren't actually written that way. They were written very much as continue. I I I prefer to call them fragmented novels, or what a lot of people call them now is mosaic novels. Yes, and I think that they were each one of those was my attempt to move closer to a novel and the race was written very much in the same way although consciously i was aware this is it this will be published as a novel when mm. it comes out that's what i intended but the fragmentary narrative which is something i just really enjoy as a reader and i i find that kind of interplay of different elements of a novel more satisfying both to read and to write than as it were a simple of course it's it's not simple but it appears so on the surface a simple immersive a to z narrative this is where the story starts this is where the story ends I've I've often started writing novels in that way and what has always inevitably happened is they've turned into novellas or pieces smaller pieces in the larger scheme of things mm. because I feel an almost insatiable irresistible urge to break it to question yeah. it to interrupt what's going on with some other form of commentary so yes you you know you're you're right it was it arose the race arose organically mm. out of the work i'd previously been doing and it's a continuation of it that's very much how i see it yes. not kind of hey now i've arrived this is a novel <laughs> it, it was just the next book yes because by that point you've been you've been writing professionally for 14 years I you? <laughs> so you know it's, it's quite a long time yeah. And yeah, I think the interesting thing about the mosaic novel, this is a term I use in work and I haven't used it for a while, I've just realised. And um, it's one of those things where the linear narrative of us as individuals, our perception, of course, in a, in a novel, you've got the broader canvas and to get the character interaction, um, which sparks plot and incident contingency, those sort of things. You know, that's that's the beauty of the novel especially when it steps away from the traditional sort of linear way of looking at things, doesn't it? Into a more sort of modern way of looking. And something else which um, which I really want to talk about is um, your writing. One thing I really like about it, which I miss in a lot of contemporary writing, is the way that you you don't shy away from the visual, from physical descriptions of physical things. So I found an awful lot of contemporary writing, both in the mainstream and in genre fiction, um, seems to shy away from description of sort of place and things, stuff. And it's almost as if um, the surroundings that characters inhabit, to some writers, seem irrelevant. But place, of course, is a character or three in itself, isn't it? And what I like is your willingness to engage with the small stuff of life, the telling detail that brings realism to any sort of narrative. And, you know, I find the untidiness I was reading some of your short stories in Art Space Travel the last few days as I haven't got around to a huge piles of stuff. You know how it is. Yes. And um, you being an ex bookseller, you know, <laughs> you tend to acquire <laughs> things. And I know you as a writer totally. acquire stuff. Yeah. Um, so but I find that really bracing. So where, where in your does this come purely from you or does it stem from your influences as a writer as well and the people you like to write to read? Um, so does that sort of ability to put all that detail in just come from yourself from other sources as well would you say i think i think in the first instance 
it comes from me. I mean, I know that, I mean, I started writing things down at quite a young age and I had the sense as a child, so I'm talking seven, eight, nine, when I first started writing things down in what, what you'd loosely call a diary. Mm. And it was, I very much had the sense that um, Nabokov calls it chronophobia, a sort of fear of time passing. And from a young age, I, I was very aware of time passing. I was very aware of being in a moment that would shortly be gone. Mm. And my antidote to that from a very young age was writing. And I, I ended up with a kind of sense that unless I wrote something down, it sort of didn't exist or it was so ephemeral, I could never prove it had existed or it was gone. Um, and you, you could never recapture this lost time. So it was in a way, a form of memory box, a form of pinning down the details. And I've often thought of it very physically as almost like a form of embroidery. You know, if you're doing point work and you're doing these little stitches corner to corner, and writing for me is almost like this, an attempt to capture the texture of a time, the mm. things that were with me in that time, significant ob objects, what people might call touchstone objects, um, things that if you come into contact with them again after a period, they instantly recall a certain time or certain people or certain events. Mm. And this definitely became an intrinsic part of my writing from a very early stage. In a sense, it was what I wanted to do with my writing, was to pin down memory. And of course, the longer one writes and the more one reads, you tend to gravitate instinctively to those writers who do similar things. And yes. I, have, I have a particular fondness for, I really love um, intricate true crime, literary true crime. Mm -hmm. um, for I'm just using as an example, um, last year I read a book that was a bestseller in the 1960s, Emmeline Williams's book, Beyond Belief. Yes, yeah. She dealt with the Moors murders. Yeah. And it's it's not unlike um, something like um, Gordon Burns magnificent book, Somebody's yeah. Husband, Somebody's Son. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it tends to it, the um, the Williams book, for whatever reason, is huge at the time. Yeah. It's kind of slipped away. Yeah, it has. I'm not even sure if it's in print at the moment. It, it, I don't think it's in print. You can still get copies. Mm. And I read this and it gave me an, a, a physical frisson, not because, I mean, the, the horror of what it depicts, that's mm. almost a given, but the background, his mm. manner of capturing the, it, the sort of like edge of towns, edge of cities, news agent stores, boarded up houses, street lighting, the, 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 the Britain as it emerged from austerity, mm. the, 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 the physical climate and the political climate and the social climate. This was the, the, the Moore's murders trial happened literally almost in, in as I was born, just a couple of months after I was born. Mm. So what is what he is describing is a world I remember the tail end of as I was growing up, I sort of fundamentally grew up in the 70s, but the, that influence, this this sort of semi broken post war background, it, it just, you know, reading this, the way he captured it is so intense. And I love that kind of writing is it's part of why I love true crime so much because you get this social commentary and so yes, this is a long-winded way of saying. <laughs> Not at all. I I I I did it, um, but I gravitate towards other writers who do it, and it, it, yes, yes, it's it's very very important to me, yeah. and it's also deeply reassuring that you picked up on this in my writing because it's something that um, Gary Budden, the writer and publisher, who was the original editor who acquired my backlist for Titan. He talks about this in my work a lot. And the fact that, you know, you others are picking up on this is some indication that at least what I'm intending is coming across. So yeah, that's great. So. Yeah. yeah. So I think just to mention on true, the true crime point, I think people 
I think in Britain, there's a sort of way people associate it with tabloid journalism. And of course, if you, if you do at the actual reading, there's a long history, both in the UK and the US, of excellent journalism in the field of true crime, because it obviously gives such great opportunity not to look at the specific, but also what surrounds it, the stage around it. And can I just ask briefly, are you familiar with a writer called David Seagrave? Wrote, wrote oh, oh yeah, all the devils are here. Yeah. I adore that book. I, I, <laughs> I thought yeah. you because there's a kind of link in a way to um, Jack, of, Jack of Jumps, Jack of Jumps as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. He's a, he's a Met Kentish writer. Yeah. That's right. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. This yeah. British British noir, which right, is right. under underrepresented and under talked about, and I adore it. Yeah, because um, there's a kind of connection in that book um, to a little bit of the Good Neighbours, isn't there, with the Richard Dad. Thing. But we will come on to that later on. Yeah. So yeah. Let's, let's sort of focus a bit more on the early part of your career and something. I mean, when I first discovered your work, I've always loved literary SF. And um, obviously your name was looming larger and we'd sort of met before that anyway. And um, when The Race and the Rift came out, I sort of jumped on them really. And it's to me, I, you know, like a lot of people were obsessed with sort of context. And to me, your writing sort of showed one thing I really like, it showed the virtues of the legacy of new wave science fiction, particularly from Britain in the 60s and 70s. And the idea that a writer could work within genre forms, experiment with short fiction, and grow an intelligent audience, and then sort of move into an area where, you know, you didn't have to have boundaries, even if you were working theoretically within a genre base, you, you know, you could even then move into stories that lack genre con con conceits. And, your work sort of embodies that sort of open willingness not to be constrained and encompasses all sorts of narrative. Um, and, you know, until the late 80s, that for a long time in British SF was the dominant characteristic where writers felt they could do pretty much anything and they could walk over the edges back and forth. And until the end of the 80s, when the space opera resurgence started. So do you do you sort of looking back in your reading and your writing, do you consciously feel part of a kind of British tradition of literary SF that doesn't know any bounds? Do you see yourself that way? I, I very I very much do. And I'm really obsessed with the new wave period because of what it did. Um, not just that, though, I I tend to view SF. I, I kind of ignore Guns back in SF in a yes, sense. Yes. I've read it, some of it. I know obviously what it is. You can't work in science fiction without being aware of the American tradition that arose essentially from pulp magazines. So we're talking so, about what we would call genre SF. Genre SF, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but the 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 tradition of science fiction that's always interested me, and I mean from a younger age as well. Is this sort of what I I've come to call the maverick strain in British literature that, as you put it, ignores genre boundaries, transgresses them, uses materials. I mean, OK, we're going back as far as Frankenstein. Yes. But I don't just mean that. I mean, I, re I read H.G. Wells when I was quite young and the, the time machine remains a, a touchstone work for me. Absolutely. Uh, but I, yes. I'm also talking about writers like. Um, like Iris Murdoch, like William Golding, like Doris Lessing, these sort of mid-century writers. Also, when I was a child, I adored the work of people like Philippa Pierce, Catherine Storr, Penelope Farmer, Nina Borden, um, right, writers that were who were right before YA literature existed at all. Yeah. They were writing for young people and using freely elements of the fantastic. There's a a novel by Penelope Farmer called the the uh, uh, Charlotte Sometimes. I've yeah, read I it that. over and over and over. Yeah, uh, so. Before I knew what SF, you know, I didn't know what SF was. I was like ten, <laughs> um, but these were the elements that really appealed to me. The idea that you could bend reality, and it wasn't just that you could do that deliberately. It was kind of the way the world felt to me. You're, you've we've already talked about my use of, as it were, prosaic elements, bringing those in. And I've always felt that the strange is just a short way beyond that. You go through that door that you glimpse every day on your walk to school. Yeah, you don't know what's there. Is there a witch there? You know, I'd make up these kind of things as I was just walking around in my life. Uh, and so the books that reflected that kind of mindset 
what I would call a, a fantastical sensibility or a science fictional sensibility, even as you say, books that don't have an overt science fictional element may be written with a science fictional sensibility. And that that sensibility seems to me to be particularly British, um, arising maybe from the, you know, the good old British ghost story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a particularly what I love and, and feel drawn to uh, still very much. Good. Well, I, I think, you know, it, it seems inescapable to me that um, that really because we have this strong tradition of SF before it was called SF, and it goes way back to Shelley saying by Wells, that they, it's always been there. I mean, Stapleton is another one, and we can cover lots of examples. It's interesting that the people we associate, probably the most famous SF writers from Britain, who we think of as being genre SF, say Arthur C. Clarke and John Wyndham, um, you know, those are the people we think of. And, you know, Wyndham, of course, was very much in a sort of English tradition, and when he wrote Absolutely. before yeah, that. I mean, and he's, he obsessed, he's obsessed yeah. with surfaces as well. Yeah. I've got you know, John he, Wyndham's he, tie here. Yeah, yeah, John Wyndham's <laughs> really. Yeah. Oh my goodness, is that for real? <laughs> I'll That's tell you amazing. a story about that on the channel before too long. Yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, it just seems inescapable, and and this is why <clears throat> one of my favourite books by you is The Rift, which I absolutely loved. It's my favourite of your longer you. books, and you know it got sort of fairly instant acclaim. You won the BSFA for it which is fantastic because the BSA is, is, is an award with enormous credibility. A lot of awards these days seem to have lost their credibility to me, but uh, the BSFA is still something I, I look at very closely. Um, with the Arthur C. Clarke, I always think the person who's tipped to win but doesn't win is more interesting. Um, <laughs> like, um, I, I really wanted Elia Whiteley to win the, the last oh, one. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She's good. I mean, the book that has won is very interesting, um, but, but yeah, hopefully her time will come. But. Yeah, yeah, you also went, you have to tell me what this is. I know what it is, but I think my audience would like to hear it from you. The Kitschy's Red Tentacle. What is the Kitschy's Red Tentacle? The Kitschy's Red Tentacle, there's an award um, called the Kitschy's, which has been going crikey, it must be getting on for 10 years now, which was set up to celebrate the most progressive, intelligent and entertaining in fantastic literature. So it's not specifically SF fantasy no. or horror it can be any of those or a Excellent. combination of works that draw on on them and that the judges deem to best represent those three characteristics and it's a bit like um the goldsmith's prize then isn't it which is for expanding the boundaries of fiction except the yes it's fiction yeah yeah because yeah. um, when m john harrison won that with the san calamus rise again um i thought this is a perfect award for for mike to win because Wonderful. you know this is what he's done for such a long time you know it's, yeah, it's, it's a great. thrilling thrilling thing to happen yeah, yeah so that's the kitchies but I, I i sell a lot of the rift at work I, I'm, I'm selling it all the time i always have a little sort of pile face out and um I'm <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. And, um, well you know it's a great book and i think <clears throat> what i really loved about it was that it ticked all of my sort of boxes because it took sort of a traditional um mimetic fiction realist motif of sibling and ease with the two sisters with Julie and Selena. And it cast the sort of relationship issues between them in um, both the problem and the solution um, around an SF conceit, which was great. And I'm going to just I'm not going to describe the plot. I'm just going to say basically for people who haven't, haven't read it. Of course, we have these two sisters. One goes missing for a long time. Um, and that's um, that's Julie, isn't it? Julie goes missing for a long time. And she reappears about 20 years later in Selena's life. And Julie doesn't have much of an explanation as to, as to where she's gone. And Selena's rather miffed. And when the explanation arises, um, it's one that really her sister cannot buy into. And it's the idea that Julie has been on another planet for 20 years. And the narrative centres around that, but it's obviously about much more. But it seems to me that why it really grabbed me was that it was around for me, what is perennially the most interesting theme in SF. And it's a theme which has occupied um, icons like Philip K. Dick and precursors like Charles Brockton Brown is a favourite early American writer of mine, which is what is reality? You know, it's one of the key questions, perception, um, subjectivity. And some, something that you do in your writing a lot is you very much have this willingness not to let the every man is an island thing pin you down and you usually have a web of interactions between characters 
And that interaction in the rift is the key to understanding the SF mystery of the heart of the book. And, you know, is, is how, how did you come to that? You know, was that your main thing to address the, the, the question of what is reality and how it differs between people? That's how it ended up, for sure. Um, the, <laughs> the way the rift was written, it happened almost by accident because mm. I've had for a long time now a big file of notes on for a novel that I want to write about the planet of Tristane and the fall of the planet of Tristane um, uh, owing to the infestation by these rather nasty arthropods called the creef that you crop up in the rift. Yeah. And the I, I've got I, I do fully intend to write this book. But it is always it was always meant to be a trilogy, one right. set on the planet, one set on Earth and one set between. And the rift was always meant to be the second book in the series. And for reasons which are too convoluted to go into, I just ended up writing it um, first. And I, I was sort of playing, playing with the characters who were going to be in it. And it just suddenly took off, yeah. as sometimes happens. And then it did obviously morph into this, in a way, the action on Tristane on the alien planet, as reported by Julie, mm. kind of takes a back seat. It's almost, it's always seen through the filter of Julie. There's no, as it were, objective reporting. No. No. And so whether or not you believe in the existence of that planet, as for Selena, mm. is a question of do you believe Julie? Do you believe that Julie is even who she says she is? Mm. Is she sane? Or if Selena accepts Julie's story, is she then deemed insane? Because yes. Yes. to accept <laughs> to accept what Julie to accept what Julie is saying on the one hand is an act of trust and belief in the sister she loves. Mm. But to do that is to actually believe in something that goes so far against consensus narratives that she's putting herself into an untenable position. Mm. So it is definitely playing with those ideas. And the scene with the sister's mother is yes, a central one yes. in the book. Uh, I hope a disturbing one. Yeah, I, I found I found that the sort of whole thing about the sisters and how um, Celine felt about how their mother was affected to be really, you know, really the, the, the one of the key things in the book alongside the question of whether Tristane is real or not. And I, I should say, I think anybody from um, the traditional end reading SF will be satisfied with the conclusion, I think. So, yeah, it's a, but that, that was really stood out for me. It, it was that that provided the locus of the conflict or interaction between the two sisters as much as the mystery in itself, you know. I hope so. I mean, it, you know, it is that. It's the, in the end, it is Selena and Julie's book, and it's a book not just about their present, but about their past, mm. how they both have and not just conflicting versions of reality now, but conflicted versions of reality growing up and how the rift, as it were, mm. it's not just a rift in space and time through which Julie may or may not have been drawn to another planet, but it's a rift that grows up between the sisters as they grow up and as their experiences diverge. And can that breach be healed? Mm. is is part of what the book is about and I and I think in the end I the way I draft books is the first draft is very much getting to know the novel I don't know where it's going to end up I, I have a vague idea of where it's going to end up I know who's in it I know what's brave <laughs> It's to happen, but I don't know. I, I will discover that book as it goes along, and that very much happened with the rift. The important thing then about the way I draft a novel is that once I have that, once I've got a hundred thousand words of a story in which things happen and characters move about, I then know where it's going much more than I did when I started it, and my response to that is to redraft completely from the beginning printing out my text, 
typing it in literally from page one in the knowledge of what is going to happen and in the knowledge of what the main themes are and in the knowledge of what the characters think and do and therefore in this creating the second draft I think of it as the part of writing where the book really comes into being. I can strengthen those themes. I can point up those relationships. I can highlight those symbols and sets of imagery because I know what they are now um, in a way that I didn't when I first began writing. So the second draft is, is really infinitely important. It is where the book is formed and it is where these themes are, 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 are consolidated. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, and well, and the results are, you know, they speak for themselves, and it's a fantastic book. And I'm um, moving on to um, um, another favourite of mine, and I'm going to show um, the first edition, which you signed for me last time I saw you, The Silver Wind, um, uh -huh. which has been expanded and revised since then. And this will that will pop up on the screen as well. And um, you won a French prize, so the Grand Prix L'Imaginaire, which um, sounds like a, a fantastic fiction award, and that was back in 2011. So you know it's it's the it's the overnight success. It takes twenty years, isn't it? And it's not incredible. To write so. <laughs> so that was really nice to get an international award. And again, we mentioned H. G. Wells, and I sort of sensed the Wells influence in the use of watches and clocks as you know time machines or indicators of time machines. And I really loved that because again, it's the small things. And again in both the shorter version and the expanded version. It's a mosaic narrative where things are layered on top of each other. And what struck me is that it again avoided that thing that you mentioned about the sort of tautology of linearity, of linear narrative, and you know, the overlapping stories, the confusing nature of time. And you know, did it did it sort of seem essential to disrupt the a lot of classic time travel travel stories they do have a linear narrative which is the funny thing about them they you know they follow a linear narrative and they might have a clever sort of um, paradox thing in them but was it essential for you to disrupt the narrative flow of beginning middle and end you know to get the real observations about time across oh yeah oh very much so i mean this but this book began from hg wells a, a particular scene in the time machine the scene at the beginning, which I love so much, where the time traveller is demonstrating his beautiful little machine, yes, yeah, which just yeah. sort of disappears in front of the assembly. Like a little carriage clock, isn't it? It's, and, it uh, is. And yeah. I have always, I've always loved that scene and where the time traveller explains about travelling forward into, you know, tra travelling forward physically, we walk, we, you know, we enter another room or whatever, but travelling in time happens in a sense, every time we think, every time we think back to another yes. to another period, he he puts it in a, such a beautiful way, sort of like you go back in time just for a moment. And I I've always been sort of utterly captivated by that conceit. And the silver wind grew organically from that. And it, the thing is, it became huge. I mean, I had so much material, and when I, you know, because I love the characters so much. Again, yes. I love I love the characters and. The, the 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 whole the concept of the silver wind arises from these as it were little personal john bar points in one's own story where you could have done one thing or you could have done another and so the stories examine what might have happened in variously variously aligned variously diverging segments of time that's what it does yeah every and step you take the wave function collapses and that creates another story so i can see how that would have built in the telling. that's right and it's sort of like in the central story the story that's actually called the silver wind the watchmaker explains this about like being almost like in an atrium of time where you might go into one room or another and it, that's what the book's about and i had so much of it and things that weren't used and that the long story about the watchmaker's apprenticeship when I originally wrote the book back in the yeah the late 2010s I could never make that novella work properly to my satisfaction so in the end I left it out of the complete book at that time but when I had the offer from Titan to do a new edition I just let the you know that was yeah. Yeah. A substantial number of years later. And mm. I knew then I, I could totally make this yeah. work. Just it was my it was such a joy to be able to bring that story to fruition. And yeah, um, it was a gap of seven or eight years, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, I, and I rewrote it completely, obviously. Yeah. I, I kind of almost rewrote the whole book. I rewrote 
I did a complete draft of the book as a continuum, as well as repointing all the original stories. So it just sort of like works now, I think, better as a as a as a book as opposed to a collection. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I've, I've read both versions and um, when I found it was coming, I was excited because I loved the original so much. And I thought, yeah, I want more of this. And I'm normally a person who wants um, things to be fairly fleet and clipped, but I, I wanted more. And because of that mosaic structure, it was just just great fun. So so guys out there, buy the silver wind, you really must. Um, and this brings me on to publishing because you're in it. You're in a, it seems to me you're in a great position. You um, you know, since um, the race came out in 2016 from Titan, your career seems to settle down where you've got um, a deal with Titan who are doing what seem to be all genre oriented works they've got the race the rift and there's ruby which is fascinating a fascinating book anybody who's interested i know you're interested in in horror anybody who likes horror cinema will particularly enjoy ruby and also if you like you know uncertain narratives it's great stuff and the art of space travel is interesting because there's quite a few things in the art of space travel which are mainstream but generally titan are looking at doing your your books which are marketable more as genre books and then river run picked up um, um, the books which were probably more easily marketed um, and packaged as mainstream literary fiction. <laughs> if anything, they, they've got the hallmarks of your original approach, which are The Dollmaker and The Good Neighbours. And, um, you know, you, you, you're you sort of, I think you're quite lucky in that way. So a lot of writers are making their debut debuts now with short story collections and they're they're not afraid to sell their work in all sorts of areas we've seen all sorts of interesting writers making debuts with collections particularly female writers actually and um, there'll be some genre stories and some non-genre stories and um you know how does your publishing status which might seem a bit ambiguous to more conservative readers how does that sit with you are you happy with having these two houses and two strands as it were well it's i mean it's not as if the I the doll maker was the doll maker was um, picked up by River Run, as you say, but it was offered. It was it was simply my next book. Yes. And um, I uh, by this point, by this point, I had an agent, a wonderful agent, and she got the doll maker in front of more people. And it was picked up by my incredible editor at, at River Run. And they are now my publisher, but I was delighted when um, Gary Budden, who was then working as an editor at Titan um, before he went full time at Influx, um, he approached it. Well, he, he took the he took the conceit to his, um, uh, you know, to his colleagues at Titan that he would like to bring my backlist that had been published previously by independent presses yes, yeah. for a greater audience and somewhat in the way that he did at Influx with Joel Lane's works. And of course, you know, and he approached he approached me um, through my agent to see whether I'd be amenable to this. And so I had this delightful surprise of continuing what had been a lovely relationship with Titan with the, the Titan originally acquired the race and the rift. And to be able to continue that relationship by bringing the Silver Wind Ruby um, back in back into a, a more commercial edition, and yeah. then they offered me they they originally wanted to do the same for my first collection, A Thread of Truth, and I said no, 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 I don't want that. You know, that's a lot of old. I want to bring some of that, but I'd also uh, what I'd like to do most is assemble a whole new collection running from the beginning to this current part of my career as a sort of overview and I wanted to curate it and they were very happy for me to do that and I was I was delighted you know to continue that relationship which has been very friendly and happy um, whilst going on in my work with River Run which is as you know continuing and I hope yes, it, yeah. I hope it very much yeah. will because I, I love them they're they're amazingly supportive to me. Well, I, I've had some days in them. I found them fantastic. And they sent me an advanced copy of Conquest, which I haven't read yet because I'm going to wait till just before publication because I'll do a review. But it is on my TBR by the side of the bed, one of my many TBR piles. You know it is. Yes. Um, and, yeah. And it's um, it's it's looking very handsome there. So that is going to wait a little while until the right moment. So it's fresh in the mind. And perhaps we can get you back and do a little interview about that once I've read it and um, sort of collected my thoughts. But to, to stick with the river end stuff, um, and, you know, The Dollmaker and Good Neighbours, uh, very striking looking books. And, you know, 
when I read them, I, I mean, there's been a trend in British publishing. It's receded a bit now, but for quite a few years, there was a thing which I call floral gothic. There are a lot of books, and I think we talked about this last time I saw you, which had sort of floral covers, slightly gothic. And, you know, your work blew them out of the water because it was so genuinely genuine strangeness and fascinating stuff. And I mean, one of your things, the imagery um, in the doll maker of Andrew the dwarf, and of course there's a dwarf in the silver wind as well. So that, that's one of your things, one of your motifs. And, you know, the relationship between the psychologically damaged actors on your stage, um, the murders, the question in the good neighbours. The good neighbours, I could see that influence of true crime and crime writing. And um, there, of course, is the question of, of the fairies in the good neighbours. Are they real? And you addressed that, obviously, in a short story before that as well. So you, you're playing with crime and gothic motifs beautifully in this work. And the former and the doll makers, really sort of touching and wounded book. And the latter depicts characters who are less sort of underground and less obviously damaged. So, you know, it is clearly how important it is you is it for you as a writer not to give readers easy answers um, because you know the beauty of your work is that one even though you reveal things one is is always thinking you know is there a simplistic easy interpretation um you know but reality is more beautiful and strange and ready for so you know is that something you set out to do to sort of reveal that beauty and strangeness and complexity in life rather than conceal it and bring it down to pat answers well definitely i mean and again it's something that just arises organically from the way i write and from my own interests and i like to say you know taking the good neighbors as an example my aim with that book was i wanted to write a novel that would feel satisfying to fans of crime fiction I yeah. didn't want to cheat anyone. I wanted them to be anyone who wasn't familiar with my work uh, and wasn't familiar with my fantastical work and science fiction. They could pick it up, not knowing who I was or what I'd written before and read it as a crime novel and find that level of detail, find that level of digging back into the past, find these disturbing truths and most importantly, find a solution. But at the same time, I wanted to provide the element of doubt, the element of mystery, the element of, of an alternative explanation that readers who already like my work would maybe be looking for yes. um, in, in this new book. I wanted, it, I wanted the book to be both of those things. And something I have always said and will say now is that my aim in writing anything is to create a work in which for the reader it would seem that even once they have closed the book the life of those characters is still going on beyond the final yes. page I, and that's why i love a certain amount of ambiguity to exist in my work i find it essential I, I, it's what is what going back to what we were saying earlier about the, the completely linear narrative being somewhat uns unsatisfying to me. I don't want A to Z. Mm. I want it, I want this kind of almost as if you're dropping in to a particular period of characters' lives and you're being shown that, but you don't know everything and you there will be things happening afterwards that you don't know about either and that I might want to revisit because I've done that several times. You'll have seen in The Art of Space Travel how stories from one period of my work might meet a new story that I only wrote a couple of years yes, ago. That yes. character is older or something else has happened to them, because for me, it's a natural way of writing and thinking, you know, what what did happen to them afterwards? Um, that, that's that's very much part of who I am as a writer, I think. I think it's interesting because um, the only book I've read recently, which was reminiscent of um, The Good Neighbours, in the way that it sort of plays with with crime novel conceits and with being an actual mystery is a book called slow motion ghost by jeff noon i don't know if you're familiar with that i totally know obviously him and i but i haven't read that one but i've seen it out there it was very good because it, it sort of had all the virtues of a strong police procedural and that's a form that i've always questioned because it can be so routine um but um you know i i love it in the work of people like <clears throat> Excuse me. I love it in the work of people like Shafal and Wilder, the Martin Beck series, which are fantastic novels. And he did this this great sort of 
police procedural thing set in the early 80s. But at the same time, they weren't fantastic elements, but they're elements of strangeness, which just sort of really brought it to life. And, um, and you know, the thing I liked about The Good Neighbours so much was that it had those virtues, as you say, of the mystery and digging into it. And yet this the the unresolvable stuff of life and the mysterious stuff of life, which is so essential to make a book interesting to me. So so that was great stuff. So there's another one, guys, to read and get out there and buy it if you if you haven't read The Good Neighbours. And we've got Conquest coming next year. We've talked about this as well. So that, as I say, I kept on the bottom of my pile by the side of the bed because it is the largest book there. And also because I don't want to go too soon. It's um, not out till May. So, you know, you don't want to you don't want to blow time. it before yeah. then. <laughs> <laughs> so just to sort of talk um, a little bit about your sort of influences and favourites, because I think something that um, people often assume, you know, it's an interesting thing having done lots of sort of SF events and selling SF books for years is that a lot of people within the genre readership um, often assume that writers, you know, even partially associated with science fiction read read it all the time. And most readers I know who've been, writers I know who've been in science fiction a long time, don't actually read much contemporary SF. They're busy reading other things and writing. Um, so if we can talk about, you know, some of your favourite writers, um, who you who you're enjoying the most at the moment, and this is across the board, SF of the Rise, and um, also, you know, favourites of all time, things which sort of stick in your head. Um, so perhaps we can talk about writers of sort of outside genre traditions, first of all, who really excites you? Well, I mean, it's interesting sort of going going back to what we were saying about the um, true crime. I really I enjoy reading people writing in that tradition. I really enjoy um, Gordon Byrne, as we mentioned before. Um, I've been Masters. say that again. Brian Masters. Yeah, absolutely. Masters. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the recent adaptation of his um, the, the, the Dennis Nielsen. Yeah, it was good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a killing for company. That's it. Yeah. Amazing. I, I really like that kind of writing. And in in alliance with that, weirdly, I've been enjoying the last two years or so, I've been enjoying a lot of contemporary auto fiction because I think it plays with reality in astounding ways. You know, sort of yeah. people have this idea that it's just, oh, it's just autobiography under another no. name. It absolutely is not. No, it's not and no. I've, I've really been loving the work of people like Claire Louise Bennett and Joanna Walsh and Rachel Cusk and Sheila Hetty and the, the and, and wonderful um, um, writer called Maria Geinzer, um, Optic Nerve and Diary of an Unknown Lady, um, Port so Portrait of an Unknown Lady. And they're sort of straight, that's a strange crime book as well. Um, you I mentioned I Rachel like, Cusk. We, we've sort of, one of my colleagues in work is a huge fan and we've sold loads of Rachel Cusk for the last few years. She's so interesting because she presents this kind of very, very calm surface. Um, and and you, you do think, you know, this is a surface, what's actually happening? But I find it quite uncanny. I find a lot of auto fiction uncanny. I find Joanna Walsh really uncanny. And she's, she wrote a book, I think it came out last year called Seed, which was about the same kind of period I grew up in, the sort of 70s, early 80s. I think she's, she's probably 80s it's sort of she's probably 10 years younger than me but again this weirdness of coming to one's awareness of oneself as a creative being and as a being that is not just existing but seeing recording and thinking about writing i mm. i love I, I you know i find this and the use of language i find interesting a lot in auto fiction because it's often very bare, very spare, oh, very yeah. factual, but there's so much intricacy and care taken with choice of words. And that's something that I really respond to. Um, so I, I am I have been reading a lot in those sort of traditions. Right. Wonderful book I read earlier this year by Will Burns called The Paper Lantern which dealt with his experience of lockdown in, well, he, he doesn't name the place, but it's Wendover. Mm. And the sort of like the, the what, what I think, I don't know whether it's Mike Harrison that calls it the thingness of things. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Mike. <laughs> I, really, I really, I mean, and of course, I mean, how can we not mention Mike? How the, can we not uh, mention you know, it? the sunken yeah. land begins yeah. to rise again. One of my favourite novels of recent years, yeah, which 
does have it does have a genre element. It does have a supernatural element, but it's so underplayed. And yeah. I watched an interview with him in which he claimed his whole aim with this book is to have the characters in that book not being aware of the supernatural element so that yes, we as readers not, are kind right. of going, fish people, fish people. And I, I love the way he explained that. And it is it is exactly that. So, yeah. you know, I'm I'm I do. I mean, I've a recent, as it were, more genre inflected books this year in particular, I have loved um, Emily St. John Mandel's Sea of Tranquility, right. which is a kind of sequel to Station Eleven, although not massively. You don't have to have, you don't have to have read it. Um, yes. yeah. You don't have to have read The Glass Hotel either. You know, there are references to both novels in it. You don't have to have read them. It's just a beautiful, beautiful book about again, about it explores similar territory to The Silver Wind in a way, this sort of immutability of time. And I have also adored a book I read very early on in the year, um, Hanya Yanagihara's To Paradise, yeah. which yeah. to me is one of the best explorations of the pandemic theme, which I hasten to add, she was writing it long before COVID, but yeah. of COVID came along in the interim and I'm sure she sort of made a few, tight, tightened up a few um, connections, which is absolutely within her remit to do so. I'm glad she did because it, it reads, it's so intense and not just about it it's not just the whole oh everyone's going down with pandemic it's what happened what particularly interested me in um to paradise which is a whopper of a book but worth, huge, every, yeah. worth every page absolutely brilliant uh, is that she examines the effects on society not just at the time but going forward and this was something that was a particular concern to me throughout covid yeah. is now happening and that she examines, you know, she extrapolates to a further extreme, but it's brilliant. And she also uses a fragmented narrative. So it, for me, that was, I think that will probably go down as, I haven't done my books of the year blog post yet, but that could well be my book of this year. Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because I think she she had that massive bestseller with The Little Life, which is another large book. And again, I sold loads and loads of copies of that. And people, a lot of people buying it seem completely unaware of a previous book, People in the Trees, which has science, yeah, which has science fiction conceit. Yeah. yeah. And it's very sort of um, abrasive and a very grim read, but it's a great stuff in it, really. I, I loved People yeah. in the Trees. I, yeah. I read A Little Life and I woofed through it. It's so, you know, but I think for, weirdly for me, A Little Life is the weakest of her three. Yes, and I yeah. thought the, the people in the trees is so tight. It's so yeah. br it's brilliant, brilliant book. Yeah. And um, I and to paradise again, re revisit science fictional conceits in a more expansive way, but no less effective. And I, I adore I adore that book and I love her project. I love her. I love her boldness. I just like the fact that she'll go out there and explore something. She doesn't you know, she's so kind of she she doesn't care about sort of current discourse what's going you know she'll just write her book and i admire that so that's, much that's that's the way you should be isn't it yeah yeah absolutely absolutely, absolutely. yeah um, I, i'm gonna recommend you something have you have you ever come across a writer called howard cannell no um howard cannell um he he teaches creative writing he's He's a little bit younger than me and he's a little bit older than you. He's sort of between our ages. He's a lovely chap. And um, he wrote a great piece of auto fiction called Fathers and Sons, which of course right. you immediately think of Tig Enyev. Yeah, uh, yeah. Easy, and, to uh, remember, easy for me to remember. <laughs> it's funny because I read I read his second novel, a book called The Sea on Fire, which blew me away. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. And he's such a lovely guy as well. And he... Um, that was great and then he did this book called fathers and sons and i think i did an event with him shortly after the last time i saw you maybe it was the next year and um no no I, i'm between the last two times we met is what i mean and fathers and sons it's the sort of narrative that normally i run kicking and screaming away from family relationships what have you but it's great so check howard's work out okay. i think you love his writing yeah and he's just in a very interesting book called the painter's friend which i don't think played to all his strengths but i think you as a writer would really like it so yeah, I howard kind of look him up and he's yeah. a lovely lovely chap um, so any sort of all time favourites you'd like to recommend to um, to sort of my subscribers, any sort of all time genre favourites? things? Totally. Which, I, yeah, I yeah. even have them here waiting. Marvellous. Because um, <laughs> I know you love to show the, the oh, book. Um, yeah. Keith Roberts, uh, block my face out with that. 
Yeah. Keith Roberts Pavan. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, post new wave classic. Um, we love Keith, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've read it. I've read most of him, but this is the one you'd have to recommend first because it's his most perfected achievement. Um, fragmented, um, fragmented alternate, um, alternate world narrative. His narrative, wonderful use of use of science fiction in the sort of lightest touch way in that the book it's a book about characters it's a book about time and the the science fiction there is almost just it's just part of the part of the structure and that's that's um you know something i love i just revere that book and i'm sure it's i i first read it when i was about 16 and it it's definitely it blew me away then I re-found it when I became a writer and it's a, a, you know, I've read it three or four times. I love it. I could start reading it again now with equal pleasure. Yeah. So yeah. that one. I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> um, then my other seminal oh. touchstone work, yeah. um, Roadside Picnic by Arkady and Boris Strugatsky. Um, Correctly pronounced there, because I... Russian is one of your things, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Studied at the university, so yeah. I, I don't think I need to sort of <laughs> introduce that to people because the conceit is so well known. Mm. Um, but again, I read that in what I think of as my first period reading SF when I was a teenager, and I was reading indiscriminately um, a lot of what I, you know, just because I, I discovered science fiction as a genre and I was just reading as much as I could and I didn't know who people were, I didn't know the history, I just used to go into my local library and there was this bay with all the Galang's yellow jackets and a lot of other books and I'd just find, take things according to my fancy. This was one of them. I also read at the, at the same time, Hard to Be a God and, yeah, the, I love Hard to be a God. and, and the Troika and other, other Strugatsky books. But Roadside Picnic is just, it's so dear to me. It's so important to me. Again, I've read it half a dozen times. I, I love this book. Um, the, Mike Harrison's wonderful 20, 2007 homage to Roadside Nova Picnic, Swing. Nova Swing miraculous book and I must just show you because I have just finished reading what I think is a very important book. Oh, okay. Markian Kamish, he's a Ukrainian writer right. and he describes himself as the representative of the Chernobyl underground in literature. Oh. This book here, Stalking the Atomic City, is his book about penetrating the real life zone, the exclusion zone around the Chernobyl reactor, which exploded infamously and disastrously in 1986. There is now a sort of thousand mile ex square mile exclusion zone taking in the famously the, the city of Pripyat, which was the town that sort of serviced the reactor. Yes. And m many, many, many villages and smaller outposts and that has now effectively been left to go back to nature. And his father, um, Kamush's father, was a what was called a liquidator. He was a nuclear physicist and a liquidator, one of the guys who literally risked their life and health to go to lock down the zone after the disaster. And his Kamish's father died, in fact, in 2003. Mm. And Kamish has written this. It's, it's kind of like a weird travelogue, a weird psychogeographical investigation of real life zone and reading it. Mm. This is like, bear in mind, Roadside Picnic was published in two, in 1972. Yes. Yeah. We are now in 2022, 50 years yes, after that book was written. And it is almost as if Roadside Picnic has come into true existence in stalking the atomic city it is the most i've described it on my blog the other day as my most uncanny reading experience of the year for that reason well i'll have to pick I, that up i see it's published by pushkin fantastic it, it is it yeah. is it's a it's what i really just recommend that to everyone and also support ukrainian writers read this book so oh, nice. there's that yeah um there is one a writer that is not talked about now oh, yeah. anywhere near enough no jonathan carroll the land of laughs his first novel and one 
I still adore. It's fantasy more than SF, but it's more weird. It's more slipstream. People often quote it as a sort of seminal work of slipstream. Yeah, which he's a real is. one off, isn't he? He's, there's nobody really like him. I, funnily enough, I mentioned him last night to my partner and saying that um, I, I, I want to dig out Sleeping in Flame, which I got somewhere over there. So Yeah, beautiful. He kind of has, and the thing I like about him as well, he's kind of writing a a, a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk, you know, a mega text, as David yes. Mitchell might put it. All his novels are somehow linked to each other in very strange. Again, you don't need to know that. You don't, as with David Mitchell, you don't need to have read all of David Mitchell to enjoy individual novels. But the more of David Mitchell you read, the more you penetrate his world and see yeah. how it's linked together. And that's absolutely true of Jonathan Carroll, who is. Um, yeah, he's a he's a just a total one off and needs to be, needs to be read more. Yeah, he's very neglected these days. In the, in the late eighties, he had yeah. things out, and you know, Legend used to do his things and that. Yeah, he's he is neglected. It's a shame, really. You need need to bring him back. And somebody I need to mention because they sadly passed from our passed from our time zone this year. The marvelous, inimitable Peter Straub ghost story um a first edition not in the kind of condition you would appreciate it steve but i know but i was looking at with it with great envy there it's, it's very lovely. beautiful yeah and you it's don't see that right? yeah and um i adore his work he's one of the finest finest exponents of horror um and i'd say literary horror he's a he's a profoundly literary writer who uses genre materials in the most expert and knowing way and I love his, I love Ghost Story. I love in particular Shadowland, which is a book that is just as good as Ghost Story, but not as well known. And I would, you know, urge anyone who hasn't read Straub, yeah, fools that you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ghost out. Story's in print. It's a Golang's paperback. I don't know that other one you mentioned, so I'll, I'll look well, into that. Shadowland, it's a right. kind of, it's, it's, a, it's kind of like a Bildungsroman. It's a, it's a, right. but it's about magic. It's about, it's just indescribable and it's it's a one of his big books it's really wonderful okay. intellectual book it's a philosophical book well it's a school story you know about these young lads and then they grow of course it follows them through their lives and one of them is they're both destroyed in in they both make seminal choices and Stroud puts it as what you, your your song or your, do you lose your freedom or do you, lo you lose your song? And one makes one choice and one makes the other and both have unexpected and sad repercussions. Right. But it's, yeah, it's a philosophical novel of great beauty and power. Um, I would and, put that on the list. Yes, and, I don't know that one. Uh, you know, and um, one more I would like to mention, because That's again, I don't think, I don't think she's oh. talked about enough. And especially not talked about enough with her ref with reference to her marvelous horror fiction. This is Joyce Carol Oates, and this is the first of her books of horror stories that I ever read. It's called Haunted, and it's Haunted Tales of the Grotesque, and they're all spins on just different ways of writing horror fiction and she writes from a position of deep knowledge and love I mean I would call you see I don't ever divide Oates and I've by no means read all of Oates because how could yeah, I uh, yeah she's incredibly prolific isn't she but, it has been yeah. for decades and decades and never a bad sentence. Let me stress this. People who are kind of Oates deniers, you know, saying, oh, <laughs> you right. know, <laughs> how can they, they are. And they say, you know, how can she how can she write that much? And it's all for, you know, where do you start? What's good? And I'd say all of it is good. I have yeah. literally never seen a bad sentence from Oates. Everything she writes is I don't I don't know. You know, I don't know how she does it because she no, also writes incredible commentary and. She's but her her I don't as I say, I don't divide her into horror fiction and mainstream because I think all of everything she writes is tinged with the uncanny. And that is why I love her. And I'd really just say where to start with Oates. Start anywhere. Just yes. read anything <laughs> because she is she's a marvellous writer. And 
she shows us how it's done and I've been reading her for years and I, I'm still looking forward to the, her. She brought out a novel this year called Babysitter, which yes. is totally my jam. It's based on a true <laughs> crime case. And she's, you know, I cannot, I, I'm hope, I've, I would have read it by now, only I've had so much that I've needed to read for either for review or for other projects that I need to deliver that I've not been able to get to it yet. But once I've finished these current bits of work, I will get stuck into that because I just cannot wait. So, right. you know, well, those those are some classics. Excellent. Um, and yes. <laughs> we could, couldn't we? We could, we could talk like yeah. this for hours. But that was great. Thank you very much. And um, as I say, maybe we'll talk again um, near to publication of Conquest. And I hope to see you next year. We, I know we, we've got plans um, to sort of meet up next yes. spring. Hopefully that will yes. come together. And yes. um, it's just brilliant. It's brilliant to talk to you. And um, I'm going to sort of say a goodbye now to team. And you and I can natter on after this, you know, and, sure. um, and what have you. But um, but thanks very, very much indeed for talking to me this morning and taking time out from your writing. Because I know I know what you write is like, you know, you sort of put yourself away there and you're typing away and it's, it's hard work anybody's ever written anything who thinks it isn't work well it is you know, i was literally type. working on yeah. a story 15 minutes before we locked on yeah. and, uh, and you know <laughs> but i need i need time to get these books off the shelf so I sort of, <laughs> i'm very organized sort of yeah. like frustratingly organized my time always working aren't they i mean it's even yeah. everything you think is goes into the work so thanks a lot nina i'm going to stop recording now and um, guys hope you enjoyed this and um, we'll talk to nina again next year and you know i'm going to leave you to it now you can you can watch us at your leisure a lot and me and nina can just have a chat bye thanks, for steve it's amazing to, amazing to speak <laughs> spoken today thank yeah, you great as always thanks <laughs>